So Stephanie, your chaplain was able to see into your eye spiritually and tell you things that only you would know about? Yes, he did. In his prayer time, that's what God told him. That's what he said God told him, huh? Mm -hmm. And only he was able to tell that because he was a, a man of God. Is that what he said? Yes. So you grew up in a, in a, a spiritual home or was it a Christian home or how'd you grow up? We grew up well, initially as a Christian. We were attached to a church. We belonged to a church, but we didn't really go much until I was five. And then um, my parents, my mom became Seventh-day Adventist and we started going to church from there consistently. And so you found all this spiritual formation in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, no, not then. Um, I was working at a hospital and though I was working at a denominational hospital, I was also moonlighting uh, for a community hospital. And that's where I ran into a, a Nazarene chaplain for the hospital. Okay. okay. Who was a spiritual director. He was a spiritual director of the hospital. And he, um, he, was... he was the chaplain of the hospital. And within spiritual formation, um, you can become a spiritual director. And that's what he had taken on. From it. So he had become. A spiritual director okay and so, but you can find that in all religions now and he just randomly came up to you i feel like there's a backstory no, here we that... had we had um i had known this man i had been moonlighting at this facility for about seven years and he was so kind he's like the grandfatherly type very kind very personal and so wherever wherever i was be it er or icu he knew i was there he would come and find me stephanie how are you doing oh what's going on in your life and he didn't want to just say, oh, you know, here, okay, I'm good. You know, how are you doing? It was like, no, how are you? Where is God stirring the waters in your life? He wanted to be, he was very real. And so he wanted to know. Um, but he would, from time to time, invite me to um, uh, meet with him once a month uh, as a spiritual friend to see what God was doing in my life. Well, I didn't know what spiritual direction was at that time. Uh, it was, I didn't even know what spiritual formation was. I had just um, come back to my faith uh, and to a relationship with Christ. And because of um, a, a very hurtful situation at the time with my family, I was angry with God. And I told him to get out of my life. I don't want anything to do with you, which is very dangerous. Yeah. I would advise anybody to do that. <laughs> Essentially, as a nurse, I had no code order on my life. Do not resuscitate because God can't do what we, he does, what we don't want him to do. Yeah. So, but fast forward a couple of years later, my grandfather was dying in the hospital. And my family called me and said, if you want to see your grandfather again, you need to come home now. And he may not be alive when you get here. I had a two-hour drive home from where I lived. And I got there and I was the very last person to see him. And he asked me to pray for him. And I couldn't pray for him. I was angry with God and I loved my grandfather. And he was very much a, a Christian man and he was good to me. And I couldn't say a lie to him. So my father came and prayed with him. And then the next visiting hour, um, that's when I was the last one to see him. I'm sorry. Uh, he... I asked him if he wanted to turn over and he nodded his head and when I rolled him over the fluids in his heart shifted Aww. and the line went flat and so um, hearing is the last to go and I just like grandpa I love you thanks for being a good grandpa you know but that was a divine appointment God was trying to reach me Amen. I was the only um, I should say Seventh-day Adventist grandchild in the family. And I lived right next to him growing up. So we had a nice bond. So we had connection. And when I couldn't pray for him, that broke my heart. Mm. And so I carried this, I don't want to say guilt, but heartache. And it was from that time, that experience that as an ER nurse, we have people who die in the emergency room, unfortunately, but it's a fact. I didn't want to not be able to give that gift of prayer for someone who um, may be in a similar situation. So I thought in order to pray for somebody, I need to have a relationship with Christ. So I started reading my Bible. And from there, our relationship grew. 
And then I found out about the sanctuary message, which I had grown up in this religion, gone to Seventh-day Adventist schools, never heard the sanctuary message. This message is beautiful and contains every doctrine that we teach. Hmm. It converted me and it gave me a solid foundation. This is why um, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and not Methodist like I was born into or another another belief system. So you sacrifice animals now? Is that what you're <laughs> <laughs> No, that went away when Jesus died. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so what was it about the sanctuary messages for our viewers who might not know I um, saw that the, really transformed your Good heart? question. I saw the love of God along with our doctrine. So it's God's love, the love of Jesus who sacrificed for us, and every step of it, you know, um, the sacrifice. And then his blood that covers us when, and he washes us when we repent. He covers us and and then he wants to cleanse us. So it gave reason for the differences mm -hmm. um, from the other denominations. And I just felt God's love and I could see the, um, the biblical basis for for all of our teachings. Mm -hmm. They were rock solid. You said the uh, other denomination, they don't preach this kind of stuff, this message. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very true because I've been going to, I, I used to go to different churches before and I asked questions and he said, yeah, I mean, I mean we, we read it, but we don't teach it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that, and that message of the century message, I mean, you can, we, you know, we, we see salvation, you know, but also the beautiful thing is that in the most holy place, that's the Ten Commandments. And that's a place that, that, that God dwells. Mm -hmm. And God wants to have that relationship with us. That and intimacy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then all religions, they don't, if you don't preach about the Ten Commandments, God's law, mm -hmm. God's eternal law. They, I mean, what is our fundamental as a Christian? What is God's yeah. ruling our life yeah. you know, and who is god because yeah. they are a translation of his character right mm -hmm. so so the, the the sanctuary message so i i, I like i like that but what mm -hmm. what is it about the sanctuary message that's relevant today because i've you know been to churches where they say that the old testament was for the old covenant and the new testament's for the new covenant and i'm a new testament christian so i don't have to worry about that old testament anymore mm -hmm. isn't there something and, and and so what i found and this is just the three things i found maybe you guys have found more than i have but mm -hmm. Those three things inside the holy place, the sanctuary, the table of showbread, the candlelight, and the, the incense. Mm -hmm. Incense, those are the things that represent a Christian character, a Christian life. Mm -hmm. When you become a Christian, you pray more. That's the incense. You read your Bible. Uh, you mm -hmm. read the Word of God, which is the table of showbread and the light, right? Mm -hmm. The candlelight is your sharing that gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so it's very relevant to yeah. our life. Is there yeah. anything else that you saw that was like an epiphany to you out of that that is relevant to a New Testament Christian like we are today? Um, I think you say all. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We have justification and sanctification all right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what he's doing. He wants Baptism. to recreate us in his image. Baptism is that is that uh, labor or on the, the water, outside the water mm -hmm. and the lamb of god is christ that was on the inside and inside the most holy place is where yeah. god keeps the ten commandments the yeah. the throne of god yeah. as it was and called, that mercy right? seat mercy seat right i think that's yeah. the people the, the thing that people forget you know in terms of new testament versus old testament mm -hmm. god is merciful and so mm -hmm. you know he was merciful in the old testament and he's merciful today god never changes mm -hmm. we like to change his words but god never mm -hmm. changes so I share that because I, I want to I wanted paint a picture that that was rock solid in our teachings. And then from there, um, I was all about prayer, right? I had read books on prayer by Glenn Kuhn, ABCs of Bible Prayer, uh, Roger Morneau, mm -hmm. and learned a lot about prayer. So prayer was very meaningful to me because of where mm -hmm. I had been. So then after a three-day uh, fast and prayer, uh, God moved me to Southern California. I'm a Southern girl from Virginia. We don't leave our family. Mm -hmm. So this was a God thing, but it was after true prayer and true Bible reading mm -hmm. that God moved. And so I remember driving cross country and praying, Lord, I don't know why you're sending me out here, but don't let me mess up. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, this is where I was. And then um, after a few years of being around this chaplain 
And then not seeing him maybe for about six months and then coming back to this facility to work, he comes to me and he, he does this. This is a Quaker way of praying. You hold, you know, I'm coming to you. This is what I have today, but you're holding yourself up so to the light. So he comes to you with this? Or like he's yeah, bringing you something? Yeah, I'm holding you in prayer. Oh, right? okay. Oh, so it's just a gesture. It's, yeah. There's nothing in his hands. No, but they usually, okay. they pray with a candle. So they're holding you up to the light of Christ and praying for you. Right, so I picture him walking down the hall towards you with his hands like this. Is, is, is Does it look like, does you know what that means? or what I didn't at the time, okay. but, but it, it was a natural conversation. When I hold you in prayer, this is what I sense. I sense heartache. I sense a struggle. I sense um, hurt, anxiety, and something to do with a man. Wow. I'm like, he just told me everything I was feeling and kind of what it revolved around. Mm. So he says, now, would you like to meet as a friend once a month to see what God's doing in your life? And because... I desired a closer connection with God. I said, yes, I would like that. If he knew, if he was so close to God that he knew what was going on in my life, mm. I wanted to know what he knew. But that's a really nice invitation. I mean, it, it was sounds beautiful. Nice. I mean, it's not something like, hey, beautiful. you know, this kind of guy is we or anything like that. No. I mean, he sincere, come to you sincere and like built, a grandfather uh, and that was a grandfather wound mm -hmm. right? and he I built a little relationship with you before he went to talk to you mm -hmm. but I, the question is like how he knows all this stuff yeah, <laughs> yeah and i don't know where the story goes but i feel like those are very common things that women deal with <laughs> and well, if they you are. were to tell like it, like those were just i don't know they just sound like very common common themes in women's lives and probably, yeah. But you know, there were good relationships yeah. too. <laughs> so, yeah. but yes, I mean, you could probably throw something out, and it's going to be true for somebody somewhere right. along the way. Yeah, yeah. But those things at this time, mm. nailed it, nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Mm. You know, so that to me it was validation that he was a man who was connected to God, mm -hmm. and I wanted that kind of connection. Mm. So what I didn't understand then was, I was. I was being invited to spiritual direction, which is a whole piece of the spiritual formation movement. So nine years, I began spiritual formation journey and... And you weren't aware, you thought it was... I didn't know what it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, but after a year, it was very much, um, it was becoming very much a part of me. Well, the first, the first session, actually, he taught me contemplative prayer. He gave me Thomas Keating's book on uh, contemplative prayer. And so I read that and I started engaging in contemplative prayer um, because that was supposed to be the most intimate place, like the sanctuary um, in the most holy place. That's where you really commune with God and that's where he can do his most sacred work cleansing work. And that's what they're teaching in the that's book. That's what they teach you. Dallas Willard, Willard says it's the, um, it's, um, Oh, why can't I think? Basically, oh, it's sanctification. That's what he calls the sanctification process, right? And I was told it's like the operating room. Mm -hmm. So that's why they encourage you to spend, as a Christian, they encourage you to spend lots of time in contemplative prayer. So then after a year of doing this, he extended an invitation. He says, have you ever thought of becoming a spiritual director? And I'm like, well, no. He says, well, there's a discernment process you can go through. It's about eight months. Um, uh, it's a course you can take and uh, if you're interested let me know I said well I am so I started taking training for that and after eight months I decided I do want to become a spiritual direction director now mind you I had been reading the Bible I had been engaging in biblical prayer those things never dropped away mm. I inserted the silence for if you're familiar with the mnemonic pray um, you know, praise repent ask and yield mm -hmm. That silence I inserted into yield, meaning I'm here listening, God. What is it you want to tell me? So uh, that was a protectant. I found out later that I didn't drop off those things. But I also, in addition to the Bible, I was also reading Spirit of Prophecy. That dropped away. 
It's not like, oh, don't read that. It's like, oh, here's this. Read these readings. Mm -hmm. And they, to me, for some reason, were so meaningful and beautiful to me that the, the, the spirit of prophecy piece fell away. Mm -hmm. My Bible reading never did, and I praise God for that. Mm -hmm. And I think those pieces, along with my belief in, uh, that when you die, you, you are asleep, waiting for Jesus to come back, uh, was a protectant for me how? The, to not hear how well one of the pieces of the healing um was my spiritual director uh, encouraged me to have a conversation with my dead grandfather imagine speaking to him about not being able to pray for him what would he say to you today mm. and my thing was you know no way i i don't believe that he's alive he won't be speaking to me but someone else would be yeah. right so uh, I'm glad that that door was never opened. Because that's part of um, Genesis, right? Genesis and the snake came to Eve and said, mm -hmm. you will not surely die. So that's been the lie that's been told forever. Yeah, and that most of Christendom believes. Mm -hmm. So, but as a result, um, I did not have a spirit guide. I did not have things manifest to me, uh, which I'm grateful. If they had, because of what I knew the Bible taught, I would have run, right? I would have left all these practices behind. But Satan knows how far to take us and when to hold back mm -hmm. to keep us entrenched. So I thought I was engaging in biblical prayer and moving forward in my relationship with God. So together with the first year of discernment and then the two-year program for becoming spiritual director, I did two and a half years. And something happened that last year. I just kept... I was, I was bumping up against the readings. I'm like, why can I not understand this now? I don't get it. And I would reread and reread and reread. And it was just like, uh, I don't understand it. So I withdrew from the program thinking, okay, I'm just busy in life. I'll pick this up maybe next semester or next year and move forward and get this done. God had other plans. He put me in nursing school. I changed jobs and I, I went back to get my credential for school nursing. And, and then my master's degree, which was part of that. So he diverted me. And then I still maintain these practices. I mean, it was, it was me. It was my life. I would go to spiritual retreats. I would spend much time in contemplative prayer. Now my roommate who lived with me, if she would come in and rattle the dishes or open the door, I'd be like, oh, you know, it would make <laughs> me so frustrated. So the fruit wasn't there, not the fruit of the spirit from the Bible, from God, but there was no growth. And she told me later, she said, Steph, I saw no growth in you during that period. Well, I didn't know it, you know, but that's how, that's part of the deception, right? We're so busy working and engaging in something that feels so good that we don't recognize the other. The other thing is repentance wasn't there because conviction never came. Mm -hmm. When your frontal lobe is offline, the Holy Spirit can't speak to you. So I never felt convicted during this time. And when I came out, the first time I felt conviction, it was overwhelming was what it was almost at first. Um, but I was grateful for it because God was once again working in my life. Um, but anyway, so that's where I was. And then my sister came for a visit and she went back when we had Bible stores. Um, she prayed before she went in and she's like, Lord, if there's anything in here that somebody needs, lead me to it. So she went in and she was looking at the books and she just was drawn to this book on the table and she didn't know why because she didn't know the content either. So she would go over and pick it up, wasn't on sale, and then put it back down. I don't even know what that is. Three times she went over there and she's like, I'm just supposed to get this book. So she got the book and when she came home, because I love to read, um, I'm like, let me see what she got. So I emptied the book, the books on the floor and my, my eyes went straight to that book and I read the back. I'm like, I'll see you when I'm done. Mm. And I went to my room and it was, um, Rick Howard's book, the Omega rebellion. Mm. Now he was from the new age and I was not, I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. I, I was convicted on the spiritual practices, but I was not convicted about um, contemplative prayer because this is how sneaky the flesh is. After all, he was new age. 
he doesn't understand contemplative prayer. Mine's biblical, right? So I continued the contemplative prayer, but God wasn't finished. And he um, somehow, and I forget how I got this book. Maybe I went to the store. Then I found Howard Pett's book, The Dangers of Contemplative Prayer. And that book convicted me. And I tell you, that was a hard book to read because then I had a decision to make. Was Some, this the New Age author? No, or? this was a Christian author okay. unpacking contemplative prayer mm -hmm. and the real roots of it. Well, part of the real roots. What was the name of that book? The Dangers of Contemplative Prayer. Oh, okay, The Dangers. Yeah, it's a really good book to get. I don't remember him going into the occult on it, but it's been a while. But um, so then, then, then I was faced with a decision. Am I going to be obedient and walk away from this? Something that's so meaningful to me where I feel that I experienced Jesus. Am I walking away from God by doing this? So it's, it's fact over feelings, right? This was a battle for me personally because I'm a feeler. So to give this up was from here. Um, not in my heart, you know, but it's like I wanted to honor God and do things his way. So every day I had to re-decide not to do that. That stuff is addicting. It's a dopamine effect and it's addicting. Mm. So what does a feeler do when no longer you experience this feeling of warmth and peace and safety? Um, you perceive it to be that, right? This was your experience, so it must be. And so there for a while, um, a short season, maybe a couple months or so, I would just do my typical prayers and leave off the silence, but I didn't experience anything. And I'm like, God, are you there? Did I walk away from you? Or was I wrong on this? So when Satan can't keep us bound in deception, he will use fear. And anyway, I, I, by the grace of God, I remained faithful to what I believed was right. And in spiritual formation, there's something called um, dark night of the soul. Now, I never experienced it in spiritual formation, but what it is, is when you just don't hear from God anymore. You're doing your contemplative prayer, but you don't feel anything anymore. Like mm. a wilderness yes. experience. Yes, season, yeah. yes, yes. Um, I thought, okay, so was that the real thing? And this is not, this is, is my wilderness because you are not here, God. Mm. But that's Satan playing tricks, right? The truth is when people practice contemplative prayer, it's void of the Holy Spirit. So they do end up with a, a dark night of the soul experience because it doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Mm. But for me, um, I feel like this was my time of testing. Are you going to be faithful or are you going to go back? And so by the grace of God, I remained faithful. And then after that, my prayers became powerful. It's like, I never experienced this in contemplative prayer. I, and just for an example, I remember someone called me, they were going to court to defend. It was for a major business and they were being accused of something they shouldn't have been accused for of at all and we prayed together before they had to take the stand and my prayer was for the other person who was wrongfully accusing if they don't speak the truth don't let them speak at all the person gets up on the stand and he has a stroke and he's removed from the courtroom Wow. This is the kind of, not that wow. I would ever wish that on somebody, mm -hmm. but this is the kind of power we can walk in mm -hmm. when we are doing biblical prayers, when we are doing things God's way. I agree. We have help from mm -hmm. above and Satan doesn't want us to have help. When you apply that to um, our lives and our characters, that contemplative prayer is void. It's not going to get us anywhere. The Holy Spirit will transform and change us from the inside, hmm. change our minds. So my mind was bound in contemplative hmm. prayer for nine years. Wow. Uh, 
I read a book um, because I was very searching God. It's called Revive Us Again by my, uh, Mark Friendly. Mm -hmm. And that little book is about help you to have a revival you know, in your own life. Mm -hmm. And it is a chapter that talks about prayer. And I never had that experience. He mentioned about you need to prayer out loud. And, you know, before it was just me, you know, mm -hmm. prayer and quietly or in your mind and stuff like that. But in that chapter, he was talking about prayer out loud. And he was saying, he said, you will feel the difference. You can see or feel the difference of the presence of God and stuff like that. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to do that. You know, I've never done it before. So I speak out loud. And it was really, really, I don't know, it feels very powerful mm -hmm. because you keep talking and you're just talking. And, and, and it was very interesting because after I was into maybe like 15 minutes praying to God aloud. And I don't really like to share this stuff, maybe like share, but I guess it's going to be sharing that. Uh, it's something like a, you have like a, like a, like a GoPro camera. And I, I was imaginary myself that I was, you know, like a camera looking from the top to the bottom. And, and, and I was kind of like imaginary in this and was praying and stuff like that. And I feel something weird. And my hair was going up and I was like, what's going on? And I'd keep praying. And I imagined it in that I was praying and around me, it was evil angel or something like that. They were kind of mm. like looking at me like that and going mm. walk around me. And I was just, it was kind of like I, I was, I didn't see it because my eyes was closed. Mm -hmm. And I was just praying and praying and, and I was like, just like, please God help me with it. You know, kind of like very out loud. And it was, it was for a little, I mean, I can think maybe like, like for five minutes, but it was a long time. And then it was, I didn't see it was an I didn't see but it was the feet it was coming down some I guess I can say an angel or something like that but with the winds it went like this and those evil guys it was just disappear wow so when about prayer when you talk about prayer <clears throat> it is powerful if we want to mm -hmm. if we don't want to we don't want to we will not dedicate time on prayer right Satan tries to use yeah. anything and everything, even counterfeit prayer. Yeah. Right? To mm. to sidetrack us. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I haven't studied more in detail out loud prayer. Maybe you maybe know, you can share something some people, like I I should do a deeper dive into this. Mm -hmm. That's a really good topic and it has come up a little bit more lately. Mm -hmm. Um some people say, Oh, you shouldn't pray out loud because then Satan knows. Satan knows anyway. He mm. knows a lot. He doesn't know everything, but he knows a lot. Yeah. yeah. He can't read our minds, but yeah, no. I I, yeah. I think that he can probably after six thousand years of looking at people's facial know, expressions. Like, exactly. Yeah. 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 But taking these promises and praying mm. them out loud in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. is a protectant. And that is warfare. Mm -hmm. And you experience that yeah. praying out loud. Yeah, I know. As as Christians, we don't understand the power that we have and we need mm. to speak it mm. because his words are life speak mm. his words i think um you know to, to make it a lot more physical i anytime someone says something about you know uh, seeing something or having some kind of vision everyone's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, i don't know mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i understand what you mean by you don't want to yeah. say anything about it yeah uh, especially um in the spiritual um what's the word i'm looking for in other occult religions, you have um, something called astral projection <laughs> and OBEs, yeah, out of body experiences, yeah. and so you, you don't want to uh, appear as if you you are mm. it's appearing, uh, seeing something that's occultic. But I do believe that we need to um, uh, verbally speak some things, and I think that's mm -hmm. important because mm -hmm. um, not it's not even though God knows our mind, He can mm -hmm. read our minds. He created us. Mm -hmm. We there's a there's a a much bigger thing going on here. There are courts of heaven that can't read our minds, and it's and and um, angels of God are standing close to us. And mm -hmm. so they, uh, even though we might, they might be commissioned to say, "Hey, I want to help this guy out." Um, 
just simply stating, hey, which side I am on. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't mm-hmm. say, I'm going to think about uh, getting Satan exactly. behind me. You know, yeah. So there, there is power in word. And it's not that we have the power, mm-hmm. but that Christ has the power in us. Yeah. yeah. And you got to see um, behind the scenes of the real battle. I know. And those angels are around us, both camps, all the time. Yeah. And so speaking the word, mm-hmm. singing singing hymns, singing yeah. scripture, uh, Satan flees. Yeah, that's a double blessing <clears throat> when uh, we read the word uh, aloud because we hear it and we speak it. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I think we need to more spend more time yeah. reading our lives. And I think another good topic would be speaking the word versus manifesting. Because mm. you hear so much about manifesting these days. So um, there is a difference. Mm. Mm. Did you feel um, any different between contemplative prayer and like when you really started praying like to God? I always felt something when I did contemplative prayer. It always felt good. Mm-hmm. Um, when I pray today, um, I don't always feel. But that's where we have to go back to the Bible. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. right? And he says, I have given you the Holy Spirit. We just have to thank him for it. Ask him and thank him. Mm-hmm. And so just because I don't feel anything doesn't mean that I don't have um, the Holy Spirit or God in my life. And I think that though I appreciate the times I might have some feeling experience as validation, it's not what we hang our hats on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're walking into a time when it's going to be difficult and the the warfare is going to become more pronounced. Mm -hmm. And so I may not always feel good, you know, because of what's happening around me or to me, Mm -hmm. but I'm learning now that I don't need to worry then just because I don't feel something that God's not with me. Yeah. So it's building my faith in not feeling something all the time. Yeah. And I think that's really important, um, especially like in today's culture, because especially when, when you're in the new age too, it's really hard to come out of it because it feels so good. And it's like when you're experiencing these feelings, um, like who can judge your experience really. Mm -hmm. And so for someone to tell you, oh, that's not real or that's a deception, it becomes really hard because it's like, you know, I was there when, you know, X, Y, and Z happened and I know how it feels. Um, Because I know for me personally, like when I was in new age, I felt very, it just felt like you're a baby Christian just constantly. (laughs) Like you just feel like your prayers get answered Mm -hmm. and, um, you just feel fearless. You feel like connected to everything. Um, and then it wasn't until I came out of that, that I started having more anxiety. And like, I just, I felt super fearless in new ways. Like I felt like I could do anything and I just had more of like a explorative spirit. And then when I came to Christ, I just had like anxiety all the time, everything. And I used to think that was a bad thing. And then I realized that I, like my anxiety, I just, I just allow it to push me to God. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, then I have to rely on him and I have to claim his scripture and his word Mm -hmm. and things like that, because, you know, it's not the same spirit that I had before, but it was really hard for me to get out of because you, no one wants to feel anxious Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. everything. And if, 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 if God can heal, if Jesus can heal, then why am I as a Christian experiencing anxiety right you know it's we are to be in the world but not of the world and there are consequences of sin so not everything is going to be rosy all the time that's for heaven Mm. so it's it's real yeah and you'll be able to connect with people who have that and give them hope and encouragement yeah yeah there's definitely an attack anytime you do come out of new age there are people who've had um who've done counterfeit healings like through traditional Chinese medicine or some alternative healing that's not biblical and they're healed. Yeah. And then when they find out what they, you know, the spirit behind the healing, then they renounce that spirit and ask for forgiveness. Their, their aches and pains come back. Mm -hmm. Do they have the faith to walk it out, you know, and trust God? 
Yeah. So, yeah. And those are things I can pull you back into. Um, I actually remember one time I was at this flea market um, back home and there was this, there were two different new agey people. <laughs> There's the ones who have the Bible verses out in mm. front of their shops. And it's like, oh yeah, God made the earth and he made all yeah. these stones and they can heal you. And then she was like, where is this? This was everywhere. In Georgia. Yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> but um, she had a beautiful shop. It had like herbs everywhere, crystal stones. Oh, it was so beautiful. And I went every Sunday. <laughs> I bought some stones for my friend. Um, and then there was another one that was more dark. Um, and what I was particularly looking for in that season of my life in New Age was amethyst stones. And um, the lady that I usually would go to who had the Bible verses out there, um, she didn't have like the bracelets. And so I would I went to this other store and that one had like skulls and all these other mm. things. But for me, I was like, I mean, it's just a stone. And I've even asked friends and they would tell me, they would say like, oh yeah, God made stones. Like it's not that big of a deal, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and so I never understood that there's powers behind these mm -hmm. things that people can pray over them. And so um, when I was going to buy this amethyst stone, I remember I picked it up and as I was about to give her my money, I just had like, you know, that feeling when you're, um, when the plane is taking off and your mm -hmm. ears just kind of like, mm -hmm. it, like there's just a lot of pressure. And it was just enough for me to drop it, like to drop everything. And then I just walked out and then I just had this, I guess you can say it's the Holy wow. Spirit. It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, and so I just started looking up. I just pulled out my phone and Googled, what does the Bible say about crystal mm. stones or something like that? And there was this one verse that came up. I don't remember where it's from, but it said like, don't pay attention to people who play with magic stones or witchcraft and huh. things like that. Across the street was a bookstore and I, and this was a, around a time too, where I was slowly getting into witchcraft because I was told it was good and it was healing. And I had also seen this demonstrated Green on witch. TV. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like white, you're using it to help people and to heal you. Yeah. And yeah. I am someone who loves natural remedies and all these type of things. So it was right up my alley. There's a deception for everyone. Yes. <laughs> but I went across the street and I remember um, there was this bookstore and I love bookstores too. Um, and what's sad about these bookstores is they also sell the same things. Like, I don't know if you ever walked into mm -hmm. Books a Million or Barnes and Noble and it's just witchcraft everywhere now. But I remember I went to the religion section because I wanted to learn more about new age. Um, and to me, it seemed like a religion. Well, it is that includes Christianity and all those type of things. So it wasn't something that I saw as a cult. It was just mm -hmm. another religion and it was more unified. And that was really beautiful to me. And so um, I couldn't find anything when I was in the religion section. So I saw the um, one of the store workers walking by and I asked him, I was like, hey, do you know where I can find anything on um, crystal healing? And he said, yeah, I'll go to the new age section. So I go to the new age section and I'm seeing, I'm walking by and I'm seeing dream interpretation, spells, satanic Bible, <laughs> and then crystal healing. And that was, I was like, what in the world? Why is a satanic right. Bible here? <laughs> right. What's this doing you know, here? and it was just, it was all in the same section. And it was just like, just all the occult stuff mm -hmm. packaged together. And I just remember just going home that day. And I was like, man, and it, it took a while to get out of because it's like, you have to awaken from that stuff. But mm -hmm. it was really eye opening for me because I was like, why is this? attached to the satanic bible and i had people in my life tell me god made these stones which is true mm -hmm. god did make but not these for stones. those purposes right exactly. but yeah exactly they're not for healing for like healing. they don't have these special powers um and yeah i a few years down the line i ended up throwing out throwing out all those stones they Good were hard for you. i gave them to friends though i don't know if they still have oh, them <laughs> throw them away but if you're yeah, watching this, yeah throw if you're listening away. please throw those away i've okay. always gone to those mom and pop shops and like oh Oh, it's a pretty stone I like this one you know I don't think I've ever bought one but um, I, I I think there has to be some rules of engagement in, involved in this because if some kid somewhere picks up and says hey mom I want this stone I don't know I, I admit I don't know everything about this mm -hmm. I don't think any of us really do but it's um, there has to be something that is very protectant of the child that doesn't know anything versus the person that's in there to buy it for healing. Yeah. 
Well, let me say this. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I have someone I know who was given something and she didn't know anything about it. She's not into crystals. She's not into this stuff, but these relics were in her house. And mm. she reached out to me this time. I'm having sores and things on my body that uh, the doctor can't fix. And I'm like, okay. Oh, and, and a clock had fallen off of her wall, a big clock, right where her head was. She had just stepped, gotten up and the clock fell. Um, the nail was still there. Big nail. Hmm. All right. I'm like, go through your house, prayerfully go through your house and look for anything with symbols on it, anything that um, may be related to movies, DVDs, you know, songs, bands, anything. And, uh, and just get it, get rid of it from your house. She sent me a picture of a, a cross, um, a glass cross, uh, with Ra on it. Ra? Oh, yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So like she found eyes? that. Yes. Yeah. And she had a mosque that someone had given her, uh, from their travels to India or wherever they would travel to. And it was, it was beautiful handmade mosque but it had all the symbols on it, right? I'm like, they have to go, get them outside the house. She woke up the next morning, nothing on her body, no problem since. No way. Clock still on the wall. That's crazy. So whether we realize it or yeah. not, there, there's attachments and yeah. that's what we have to Attachment. look at. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I, mean, I, do, I, do, I do believe that there are, it is biblical because God said, hey, Satan, you can only stay at this tree. He's a, you know, you are, this is where you're, you are uh, allowed to hang out. And so, and then we told, Hey, no, don't go near that thing. Um, and so maybe there's something to it. I don't think, I think we see through a glass darkly right now, but man, it's, it sure is confusing. That's really it, weird. And yeah. Satan likes to keep things confused, right? Yeah. So we just have to be prayerful and careful and, you know, research everything. Yeah. And there's forgiveness too. I mean, we do plot along sometimes and get involved or given something that we don't know about. Yeah. But when we find out about it for sure, yeah. then we have to get rid of it. Yeah. And God does, there is a level of protection there and God does step in because I mean, I didn't take the stones home, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like I had that whole experience mm -hmm. and which is weird because I know like, yeah, we talk about rules of engagement, but I also, and maybe too this has to do with other people's prayers for me because there were times where i wasn't huge on prayer during that time um but i still felt like god was like doing things without me asking um and of course later you find out that's your family's prayers or your parents <laughs> prayers but it just shows how important prayer is mm -hmm. um but what's crazy about what you said was uh, how her sores went away and it's so interesting because in new age and occult practices it's like this deception that there's good spirits and bad spirits but they're all on the same team and it's like people will have all these protective necklaces and mm -hmm. things like that to protect you from evil spirits and they're literally the same spirits and yes. it's just crazy how there's this yeah. constant back and forth of okay i'm healed from this but i'm sick and so i need to get deeper into this occult practice mm -hmm. in order to like solve it we're told that Satan causes illness and then he can he brings in the healing. Yeah. Yeah. So he likes to play tricks with us. He does. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So some of my practices in spiritual formation, um, definitely contemplative prayer. I walk the labyrinth, which if you look at the design of it, it's basically geomancy, divination by shapes. Um, it, it does something to the brain as a contemplative practice. It takes your mind offline. It's left, it's right brain rather than left brain, like a real maze with multiple doors. And you got to remember a maze is one way in, one way out. So you mm -hmm. don't think about it. It's Lectio Divina, which is divine reading or sacred reading of the Bible. So it has the appearance of being biblical and reading your Bible, but it's not. So what Lectio Divina is, and we, we did this in spiritual formation all the time. It was a practice. I didn't do it, but it was practiced a lot. I could lead you all through this, but you would take, they always encourage a small passage, right? So you, you just shrunk the scriptures. Um, one or two verses, you read the verses out loud three times. You emphasize um, different words each time you read it. And 
after the third time you consider what word or words popped up for me that <laughs> that resonated with me and then you take those words or word into your contemplative prayer to see what God has to say to you about that. Now we've already established that that's another spirit speaking to you. When you're, oh, here's important. When you're in contemplative prayer, your brains go from beta, which we are in now, thinking, discerning, mm -hmm. um, to alpha brain waves. Mm -hmm. Our minds are offline. MRI sh scans show decreased uh, blood flow. Um, that's where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. So we shut the door on the Holy Spirit. We've opened ourselves up to other spirits, other beings, as Alice A. Bailey says. Um, when we are meditating, then beings from past, present, and future can drop thoughts into our minds. Uh, we know those beings are demonic, mm -hmm. right? They are not other people who've lived in the past. So I, I in this, where was I going with this? So in this um, way of, in this brainwave pattern, uh, there's only one spirit that's going to speak to us. So we have just extracted a word or two from the scripture when we're supposed to study line upon line, precept upon precept, mm -hmm. right? Compare scripture to scripture. You can't take the word of God out of context mm -hmm. and think you're going to understand what God is wanting to tell you when it's another spirit, mm -hmm. by the way. So that's how the, re the word of God gets rewritten from my experience, from what God tells me in my prayer time. And we should not be teaching other people to do this. This is dangerous. And so um, I just want to get that out there because it's really coming to the forefront from solid ministries right now and, and, and misapplied in terms of support, spiritual support, you know, from leaders. But um, outside of that, contemplative, oh, and then I had uh, a sacred space. That's another thing, sacred space. Uh, it was just a little table that was by my bed, and I had my singing bowl on it. I would use my still wow. singing bowl, uh, my little hand lab, handheld labyrinth, and a candle, always a candle, and whatever artifact, like if I had been, if I had written a poem, if I had something, some object that was meaningful to me, I put it in my prayer space. That's my offering to you today, Lord. What mm. do you have to say to me about that? Um, but sacred space, uh, in, in witchcraft, there are two sacred spaces. There's one to protect the person, um, and then there's one for divining. So if I'm going to um, raise a spirit, then it's for that. Or if I'm going to practice magic in some other form, I'm going to put that circle of protection around me. So this sacred space, the spiritual formation talks about, is rooted and grounded in the occult and witchcraft. Um, and yet we have authors, Christian authors like Mark Battison, who wrote oh, the, the Circle, circle. Maker. Yeah. And then we have other denominations um, who read these books and then bring them to the forefront mm -hmm. and teach their their congregation mm -hmm. to pray circles around, you know, I can just draw a circle and that, that releases God's power to work on your behalf. I'm praying for you. Mm. That is just, yeah. so these, these things, you people wonder, how in the world does she get into this? I would never do that. Here's how you do it. Compromise, not knowing the word of God well mm -hmm. enough to stand on the word of God wow. and then having a trusted person bring it to you, your pastor, your youth leader, whoever, someone you trust, bringing you these practices, oh, this is going to bring you closer to God. And yet we are told um, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, we have to stick with this and these yeah. ancient forms of doing things mm -hmm. are not from God. Yeah, I think that's powerful because I think what we see a lot now, especially with social media and all these big name pastors, mm -hmm. um, people aren't studying the word for themselves. It's read everybody else's opinion on scripture, but, you know, never actually dig into it yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a weird way of saying we need somebody to intercede between us and Christ. Mm -hmm. And he gives us the word, you know, right there in front of us. And it's almost it. gone as if you if you scream the loudest, then you must be correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Or who, if you come up with the most um, like these unique ideas that no one has ever thought about, 
you know, it's, yeah, it's crazy. And all it takes for these pastors is just a little bit of pride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And then it's, it's over and, and yeah. And going outside, um, the light we've been given, we have the Bible and we have spirit of prophecy. Yeah. We don't need anything else. Ellen White says, don't open the lid of another book. She also said spirits accompany these books. These, they're mesmerizing. And then we introduce them to our people. There was something else I was going to say. Oh, um, the one thing that people keep telling me as they roll their eyes, why throw out the baby with the bathwater? <laughs> okay, somebody did give me a different version. Eat the watermelon, spit the seeds. Yes, I never heard that before. <laughs> and that came from someone I respect. Yeah. But uh, you, cannot, you cannot have your feet planted in two camps. And it's confusion. And if we're going to be calling people out of confusion, then, th you know, with the three angels' messages, then we can't give them confusion and say, come out of it. This is a Catholic author. This is a great book. You should read this, Practicing the Presence. Um, you know, Brendan Manning. This book gets put out into churches and brought forward in prophecy seminars. You should read this book, you know? And yet, oh, the beast, you know, we have to come out. But read this book. Wow. It's confusing. Hmm. Yeah, we hmm. can't look to man, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit in mm -hmm. each of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about sewing a stick. Oh, the stick. Did you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> this was like a little minor thing. Um, in uh, spiritual formation, some of the exercises, one of them um, was called the talking stick. I mean, it just sounds woo-woo, right? But <laughs> whoever has the stick mm -hmm. can talk. And you just say oh. whatever you feel impressed to say. Mm -hmm. And it gets passed around. I know. I had to learn this in class. Wow. I never touched it again. It was $10, weird to class. me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just talking stick. this. <laughs> so, yeah. You pass the stick. And then you, it's, mm. it's a very contemplative exercise. So, you're mm. in this, like, contemplative mindset. And then uh, whatever God tells you, then you say. Mm. And it's like, okay, how does it connect? When we've all said our thing, what does that mean? What does it connect? <sighs> it's woo-woo. But when I found out later, after I come out of this, witches do the same thing in their coffins. Wow. Do they really? Yeah. So there's nothing wow. new under the sun. All of this stuff is repackaged and given the Christian veneer. Guys, yeah. Yeah. And Alice A. Bailey says, um, it's a long quote, and I can't remember it verbatim, but she says, the, basically the new religion will have the Christian lingo it will appear mm, to be, yeah. but inside it, it'll have it'll have its exterior trappings, but it, inside it'll be different. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that with the emerging church. Vocabulary sounds really close to what we're used to as Christians, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Like missional versus mission or missionary. Mm -hmm. Missional, this means we're social justice. We do programs to make people's lives better around the community versus going to another country or something like that to proselytize. We don't teach prophecy um, as a missional church. We just help make a difference in their life. Hmm. Ex ex um, accept them where they are. And then kingdom, you know, kingdom is right here, right now, not where we're going to be going, even though Jesus lives in our heart and wow. he's in our kingdom. So it's very, and you expand the kingdom by accepting and embracing, accept and embrace. So it's very, it like like Bailey has accomplished uh, what she set out to do, and we know the spirit that was driving her. Mm -hmm. So wow. this is why the churches look different. This is why mm -hmm. things like this are coming in. So when I came out of this um, in 2012 fully, I thought I was free and clear and under the radar. Mm -hmm. And then in um, 2016, God had me um, write my testimony. So not only did I have to share it, but the world, right? Mm. But there was a reason. As someone who was delving into this, I was going to become a spiritual director and bring it into my, my denomination because we needed this, right? Because uh, it, everything was dry and boring. We needed love, right? And so there's this, there's this tension that we have to really find a balance to, love and works or love and law. You know, and so I had experienced the law 
Um, and then I experienced love in spiritual formation, but coming out of error and so anyway, I had to, I had to re-experience or relearn what love is. It's mm -hmm. sacrificing, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus sacrificed for me. And so as I reworked that, um, and my relationship with him became living again, then that's where God's love is. So as I was come out, coming out of this and doing the research for the book, that's when I started to see how spiritual formation fit into the emerging church and how all these pieces are rooted and grounded in the occult and witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And today, when I talk about these things, they, most people like me, they didn't get it. They're like, what are you talking about? That didn't make any sense. They don't mm -hmm. see the connection. You yeah, have to study this. You do. Mm -hmm. The Bible says study and show yourself approved. Mm -hmm. So, and for lack of knowledge, people are lost. Knowledge doesn't save us, but you know, um, it helps our footing. In writing my book, it was the very last um, piece of it. And it was sent to a different editor. At that point, Remnant had taken it over and they were going to use an editor, but they were all busy. So they, they um, brought in, they contracted one for this book. And I had kept this book really close, only with trusted people I knew because of the content. When I got that book back, the manuscript back, everything that I teased apart to, pair, to compare and contrast got reblended. Mm. It was all confusion. Mm. And yet this person said they didn't know anything about this topic. Well, somebody, some spirit knew because it blended again. But this is the attack. Um, and when this book goes into, you know, the little mail, not mailboxes, but the, like the ministry magazine mm -hmm. uh, or the catalogs. No. They're, a little, they're like these uh, metal boxes that people s s kind of support and they'll put literature in there. Mm. And there, there's a gentleman who has included now my book. He says, Steph, nine times out of 10, I go back to that, that dispensing machine or whatever, it's free. And he says, your book cover is ripped off. It's torn up in some way, it's marked through. And he says, there's an attack on this book. So you can't tell me that Satan's not pleased. You know, he's not happy about what's being exposed that is a cult and demonic. Um, so to me, that's just more validation of what I'm finding. And I'm not the only one who's found these roots, mm -hmm. you know, where we, it's consistent yeah. with other people who do the research. So, um, yeah, we are dealing with, with real spiritual issues, mm -hmm. whether we realize it or not. Wow. Uh, would you like to share your, uh, with our audience, uh, maybe somebody out there is going through maybe the same thing you're going through, or maybe they know somebody that they, maybe they're doing contemplating prayer and maybe they're cold or something like that. Maybe you need to look at the camera and just talk to them. Maybe you, you final thoughts or something you want to share. Okay. So if there is anybody out there, if you are practicing, um, these practices or even just one of these practices, uh, really pray about what you're doing and do a deeper, deeper dive. Don't, just trust information that someone has given you. The ultimate person we need to look at is God and what he says, and we have his word. Um, I failed for not taking him seriously at his word and studying deeper, and I missed a lot, and I don't want that for you. So um, don't look at people, look at the Bible, and compare what you're doing with what he says. And it may not feel good, but if you obey him, the blessings will far outweigh and your life will never be the same. Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on the program today. Mm -hmm. That was a fascinating journey through your life. And your uh, this journey is, is only begun because God has an amazing, amazing future for you and how you're uh, presenting this information to other people. And we really appreciate it. Oh, praise God. Thank you. Where can people find your, uh, your, your material? Right there. So <laughs> sgriffin.org. Um, if you want to look for me on YouTube, Stephanie Griffin Ministries. I'm sometimes with these guys. It's kind of fun. And uh, uh, Facebook, Stephanie Griffin Ministries, as well as Instagram. 
And you can contact me through my website. We'll love to hear from you. Yeah. And also you have a uh, documentary coming, right? Oh, Share yeah. About... Mystified. Yeah. Mystifiedfilm.com. Go check it out. Should be out. Well, I'm not going to say because <laughs> there's so much going in there, <laughs> yeah. but it's getting really close. Mm -hmm.